So I get the luxury, I'm going to try and hump up here, of uh, sitting with this esteemed panel here and getting to talk to you guys a little bit on uh, helping them facilitate this conversation, talking a little bit about internal harmony, I guess is the way that we phrase this. But essentially, you know, how do we align our organizations? This is a question that I get asked, as I've told many of you, many, many times. Every time I talk to a new enterprise that's thinking about either doing something with customer success or talking about some challenges they have, most folks are wondering about or struggling with this internal alignment, particularly around customer success and sales. That tends to be the one I get the most questions at about. Sometimes there are other areas as well, such as um, the, uh, let's say, the build versus buy. You know, I've got my team, my internal IT team wants to build something versus maybe buying a platform. How do I think about that? If we have time, we can talk about build versus buy, but I think for now, I would like to just focus this conversation on sales and CS and so forth. So I'll start by asking my panelists here to just please introduce themselves quickly and tell you a little bit about their company, uh, because the, everyone's coming com uh, from a very different place. I'm Tammy Bure, I'm Vice President of Client Experience for the Data Division of Randall Riley. Randall Riley provides digital marketing as well as events, recruiting, and also several different data products which provide uh, some data insights, market analysis in multiple different vertical markets. All right, well, Kevin O'Kame, uh, Senior Vice President of Customer Success here at Tatango, and uh, very privileged to get to work with all of you. Uh, I'll just also say that prior to this, I uh, had uh, worked at CA Technologies uh, for about 20 years, and for the uh, last eight years of that, had a chance to really lead uh, customer experience transformation, uh, which included voice of the customer programs and a lot of the uh, change and transformation activities across the company, and then also the customer success organization as well. And Kevin, maybe uh, could you tell folks a little bit about the size of the organization that you grew there and where the locations are, because I think it's particularly relevant. Uh, sure. So we, uh, at, at CA, had um, uh, a global organization uh, that was uh, distributed with several different customer success models. So we had a, a high-touch model. Uh, that uh, truly was globally distributed in that uh, we, we place people as close to customer site locations as possible. Um, and uh, also had a me medium touch model uh, that was covering certain uh, business lines of, of products. Uh, and then uh, that was uh, you know, kind of hub based uh, where we had some locations in Prague and Plano uh, and then leveraged uh, uh, you know, uh, content and, and automation capabilities in order to reach uh, other customers as well. So all in it was about 170 person customer success team. Hi, I'm Katie Patel. I am the Director for Client Success at Waystar. Um, Waystar is a software company that serves um, healthcare providers across the continuum of care from anywhere from a large health system to a two-doc practice. And we support the revenue cycle function, so the accounts receivable and the business side of healthcare. Um, from a client success standpoint, we are relatively early in our journey. Uh, we became client success about 14 months ago, um, and we have about 40 CSMs within the organization um, with high touch um, for some of our largest enterprise health system clients, um, mid touch, as well as um, a pretty decent sized tail that um, we're really looking to leverage to Tango for to uh, better automate and serve that client's client, base, client base, excuse me. I'm uh, Umar Kavlakolo. I'm the Vice President of Customer Success at uh, Data Intensity. Uh, we are a sort of managed services business, managing enterprise apps um, for about 300 customers. And I'm sort of trying to transform the function from a traditional technical account management into a more business-focused, outcome-based, customer success with mixed results. Um, prior to that, I, mean, I spent my, my, almost my entire career in this line of business in managed services. Prior to that, I was uh, with SunGuard, where I managed a similar function with renewals. And I'm uh, fairly familiar with fighting with the sales guys. Um, <laughs> Across the globe, uh, 150 people, so we somewhat outnumbered them, so we used to win the battle. <laughs> Start with a uh, just a level setting question, which is 
I think we've all heard today about the land and expand um, and so forth. So I think we're all in agreement that the sales organization owns the land, right? They sign the customers, they bring them on in. That's good. Everyone's in agreement on that. But the, I think the next question is for your particular organization, and Kevin, when you were at CA, how are you thinking about the uh, expand and the renewal? Who owns, you know, uh, Dillup has said many times, you'll, if you talk to Dillup, you'll hear him talk about uh, d dimension data, and he'll talk about AER, adopt, expand, renew. So obviously adopt, you know, um, onboarding and adoption, those are clearly customer success functions. There's not much controversy there. So the question is, the expansion and the renewal in your company, who is driving that, you know, organizationally, where does it sit? Um, and how are you, uh, you know, kind of working through alignment issues that are, that are uh, coming up? Why don't we start with you, Tammy? Uh, for us, it really depends on what products the client's already subscribing to and how much potential there is for cross-selling versus just upselling in the data products. But for the most part, the client success team does own the expand portion of it. We're really the ones who are talking to the clients, proving value, and showing them how if they subscribe to more data, they can drive better business results, expand their business, justify taking on new product lines, and things like that. For the larger accounts, we do try to have those discussions with the salespeople on a monthly basis of how we're going to be approaching certain clients. But honestly, usually it's just something we run with. Sometimes it's luck of the draw as a client calls into their client success manager and we're able to have a conversation that we hadn't planned on. But other times, we're really the ones who put the time into researching the client, researching what's going on with their business, researching how their competitors are doing so that we can best position that. And uh, I'll give the two perspectives. Uh, so uh, here at Tatango, uh, for the uh, expansion responsibilities, it's actually uh, uh, shared um, but differentiated depending on if it's uh, an incremental expansion for, uh, let's say, the same part of uh, the business. Um, and that would be owned by the, the customer success team. Um, if you have uh, an expansion event that requires really reselling into maybe a new business unit, uh, you know, completely different use case, uh, that would be uh, in the sales organization. And so uh, overall, while there's customer success responsibility and accountability for expansion, uh, there's uh, really differences in how that gets applied across roles. Uh, when it comes to renewal, uh, that, uh, that sits squarely in, in customer success uh, here at Tatango. Um, I'll give the CA uh, uh, portion of that uh, really briefly as well. So. Uh, when it came to expansion, uh, there, were, uh, there was a focus on recognizing, identifying opportunities. So all of the work that goes into uh, you know, generate that happy, satisfied customer that's getting, uh, getting value um, and that actually wants to grow and expand, uh, the identification of an opportunity was done by customer success, uh, but we had a handoff process that brought it back to, uh, to sales and then uh, sales would actually uh, handle that contract event. Uh, and a similar uh, story on renewal, uh, really uh, all of the work that uh, created a renewal-ready customer uh, that was getting value uh, was done by the customer success organization, uh, but just given the, the size of the portfolio, uh, there was a specialized role that sat within sales that handled the contract event around the renewal. Sure, so it's inconsistent. Um, so in our high-touch, high-value from a renewal standpoint and expansion, it's really a team approach. So it is the, the client success management team is really, they're generally leading it. They definitely have more touch points, but the idea is that the sales um, executive is very tenured and, and intended also to stay with that client for a very long time. So these are massive organizations. Um, so the approach is, is very team oriented. Um, with mixed results, I, I wouldn't say, we haven't been doing that for a terribly long time to, to judge it yet. Um, and then really in the mid-market side, client success um, owns the renewal wholly. Um, and expansion is really around kind of generating those leads and then handing them off uh, and, and doing what we can to help sales close that. Um, so it differs. So, um Data Intensity has a, a bit of an interesting approach to renewals. Um, one of them is uh, they got auto renewals in the contracts. 
So the philosophy is let the sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> so it auto renews. But one of the sort of the, the negative consequences of that, your entire revenue base is at risk every year, right? So while you solve the short term problem, every year you're in crisis. A big whale disappears, now you have a huge term problem, right? So, so we're trying to solve that um, by, we, we hired um, renewal reps. So all they do is work on renewals, uh, supported directly by customer success organizations. So we'd be essentially set um, strategy, because those guys, I think somebody was saying early on is that uh, their renewal strategies cut the price and see if the customer signs. So we try to sort of provide that feedback so that uh, there's a true renewal strategy. And that's sort of work in progress. And uh, they work for me now, but I don't want it because uh, there are some macro conditions that are impacting the, the business that we are in. So I think we've got to get a lot more strategic. This is not a renewal problem. This is a, a bigger macro problem. But in, in a prior life, I think we solved the renewal piece. What we did is every year we looked at the book of business that was going to renew. We'll identify the competitive ones. We'll say these are difficult. Customer success may not be the right place for these. Let's give them to professional sales guys. Let's pay them. And the rest, customer success would, would manage. In terms of selling into the install base, um, we never paid our customer success people for uh, expansion because I am a firm believer. I think partly I'm driving that is that I'm, I go to customers, I say, I don't get incented by how much business you get from us. Right? So I am solely measured by how much happiness we deliver to you guys. And I'm very sort of particular about that. that. That messaging is very important. Otherwise, there's role confusion and the customer, who's this guy, who's that guy, kind of stuff. So, um, and that delivers sort of, we, we identify the leads and we tell the guys, the sales, and the sales guys love, love us. Right. So, and then they leave us alone when the renewal discussion comes along. So it creates some harmony. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. If Workfront was here, um, who is, I don't think able to make it uh, to this event, and Sue Melton, who's the uh, CEO of Workfront, is on our cab, what she tell you is that Workfront firmly believes that the CS team should not be involved in any kind of revenue transaction. They very much want the CS team to be driving just usage of the product, and they almost think of the you know the, any kind of contractual transaction as like a negative thing. So. Uh, so I think you see, even from the panel, that there's just a, a, a really a strong variety, very you know, uh, disparate variety of approaches from renewal reps to um, a more classic, say at CA, handing off the leads to um, the, sale, the CS team actually having quota. And so let me ask one more question about that and move on to the next question, which is the expense side of the house. So uh, at Tammy, for you guys, are you, do you have any kind of quota for your CS team? They do not have a quota, mm -hmm. um, and I'll agree with Umer, I do not believe that client success should sell, but I also always say we sell all day long by proving value and showing why the client should continue to use our product, and as being their trusted advisor and showing them how they can help grow their business, that in turn, I believe, generates more revenue opportunities for our sales team. Mm -hmm. So we find a lot of opportunities, but the CS team does not close those opportunities. Interesting. Katie, how about you guys? Do you, do you give quota to the CS folks? How do you think about that? We generally don't. I will say we do have a hybrid model since we've grown by acquisition. I have a team right now that is paid um, commission. So I, I have an interesting experiment that I'm just running for two quarters. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that the team with commission is selling more. However, um, it's at the expense of, of client success in my 
frank opinion. I, I, I think they're overly motivated for to close deals for those particular clients and products where they, they can get it done and, and are distracted by that and not kind of driving some of the value that um, our other CSM team members are. But I think the hard challenge is if you don't have the, if you can't directly point to revenue coming to your CS team or your CS team directly driving that revenue, how are you gonna get the CFO to give you money to have the resources that you need to bring on the renewals? And I know there's a few CFOs out there in the audience. I could ask them that question too. So how do you handle that aspect of it? We log opportunities for our sales team. And in CRM, the client success manager is listed as the lead source. And we then pull monthly reports. And I do a monthly newsletter that goes to um, just about all managers across our organization. And that shows how much we have renewed that month, how many uh, opportunities were surfaced to sales, and how many opportunities were surfaced to sales and closed that month, along with that revenue amount. Mm -hmm. And okay. could you share maybe with the team a little bit about any results that you are comfortable with? Do you have any metrics, like a standard you're driving to, or a goal you've set? Um, we have, on an average month, we will have about seventy-five to eighty-five thousand dollars a month in upsells from our client base. I think our our largest month was um, one hundred and eighty-seven thousand that came directly from the client success team, and those are fairly large numbers for us. Great. Kevin, how about you? Um, so uh, here at Tatango, uh, there is uh, ownership at the, at, for the expansion number. Um, and, and what I would uh, uh, also just offer, in the absence of having uh, that, uh, the other uh, obvious category would be uh, renewal also. And so any uh, performance benefit and renewal yields and, and rates obviously can contribute to the, uh, the business uh, return. Um, and the other just industry category around uh, monetizing any of the services can definitely uh, you know, help with the funding model and creating a sustainable one where uh, you can show a, a real return. And so uh, some of the money coming in from those services uh, with expansion opportunity, with renewal, and then maybe uh, perhaps a decreased cost to serve or e even a, a difference in sales and marketing expense uh, by having that precision and role clarity. I think those are some of the, the areas that you look for in establishing an ROI. Mm -hmm. And what are you, Umar, what are you guys going to do with regard to your renewal reps? How are you going to incent them? So they get, I think, 1% uh, of the ARR for the first year. So, I mean, when I had the, the CS function in a prior role where we were managing these sort of what we called non-competitive renewals, we got pretty good results. Actually, our renewal rates were 85%. So, but I'm in this services business, right? And we're not selling a product. So it's a little bit different. Uh, Every sort of, it's a snowflake, right? That's that, that problem. So in the managed services business, everybody is buying sort of, sort of a slightly different business. So um, it worked back then. But right now, so the tensions in the managed services business, it also involves the operations as well. Mm -hmm. So now we have the sales, the ops, and the customer success we're fighting constantly. I can't renew because the ops are awful, right? Well, I can't sell anything because the customer success people don't know what they are doing. So they get in, they do something, they say something, everything goes south. So uh, this role confusion inside the organizations, unfortunately, in, in the services business in particular, um, is very problematic. And, and incenting them, I mean, I incented them based on MBOs, right? we said, okay, so you have a book of business. I had this, um, I made up this metric, stole it from these retailers, same customer index. Mm -hmm. So you have a book of business, it's 105% at the end of the year. Right? So after all the puts and takes, mm -hmm. so give me 5%. So some portion of their bonus, so that I can stay true to that principle that customer success, true customer success, is how we measure our team while giving enough incentive to the guys so that they are attending to them the right way. But don't you think that 
the customer success team is the one who's really spending most time with your customers or with your clients. Uh, you know, we kind of use these words interchangeably. And therefore, they know the customers best, and they're probably better, most able to identify the opportunities and in some ways maybe uh, work most comfortably with the customer on that opportunity, right? And going and bringing back in a salesperson who may be overly aggressive or maybe is you know, long gone working on something else, comes back in, doesn't have the context, doesn't know whether I want to drink or I'm you know, eligible to drink and all that from Guy's uh, conversation earlier. You know, does that not seem more disruptive to the customer to bring that salesperson back in? Sometimes, yes, absolutely. Uh, it really depends for us if it's a named account or a house account. It depends uh, if they are a digital as well as a data client. Um, if they are digital and data client, the sales rep has ongoing monthly communications with that client, but probably not the same contact that we have on the data side. So we also have a lot of snowflakes. And there are times when client success will suggest sales not get involved. The, con the salesman then just flips the contract out and never talks to the client. Sometimes it's just harder to relay what the client's doing, what they want, and get it back than it is to um, hand it off in the proper channel. So we make it work. And if you, if you, uh, if the salesperson doesn't come in for the renewal or for the upsell or whatever the transaction is that's happening there, do they get compensated on it? Yes, they do. <laughs> So they don't think it's a really bad arrangement to just stay out of the way. It's taken away the territorialism that has happened across our accounts. And you don't get pushback from your uh, CFO on compensation where there is no, they're not actually involved? It's budgeted. So they, they just look at, we're growing business and we're doing what's right for the customer. So. Just one comment. I'd, this might be unique to our, our organization, but it, it seems as if sales, they have more authority um, and, and like the process and the people on the ground to get contracts turned and things like that. So it's often that the relationship in a team selling environment is that the client success team is doing you know, it's consultative sales. We're doing all of the mapping out with the client, you know, getting them comfortable. They understand the phases, whatever it is, making all of that work. And then the salesperson is like getting it approved and getting the paperwork and things like that, which is great because we don't have much authority to do it anyway, um, nor do we care about kind of that administrative side of it. I, that might be unique for our organization, but um, it tends to be, I think, the why behind, although. I'm sure we could get beyond that. Mm -hmm. Let me get, ask you guys one more question while I do that, and I'll let you, uh, everyone in the audience, if you'd like to ask any questions, feel free. So think about that for a second. Um, is customer success part of the sales organization, or is it a totally uh, separate and kind of parallel organization in your companies? And Tammy, let me start with you. Oh. You have an interesting <laughs> story. Tammy's got a good story. As of today, <laughs> they are separate organizations uh, in about, uh, Three to four weeks, we're announcing a reorganization. And that, interestingly, is going to have client experience, client success reporting to sales. But our SVP of sales has just changed his title to SVP of client experience. So although I will technically report to somebody who has grown up in sales, <laughs> on paper, it now looks like sales reports to experience. So I guess I win in that. And the funny thing is that's Tammy's title. Yes, he took my title. <laughs> He's just SVP. <laughs> and, and so at uh, Tatango, uh, organized under uh, Jamie, are all the essentially uh, go-to-market functions. So uh, as a chief operating and, and customer uh, officer, it's uh, the sales, customer success, and, and marketing uh, all together uh, representing those go-to-market. So it's a parallel organization, uh, but definitely uh, tied at the hip. Uh, at ours today, it's separate, so parallel organization. I report up to the EVP of client success. In three and a half years, though, I feel like every other year it switches. <laughs> so, so it's kind of gone into and out of sales? And, and, yeah, mm -hmm. I came into sales when I joined, not sales, but you know, rolled up through that and then flipped out, flipped back in, we're out again. <laughs> so in our company, it's separate as well. I mean, I work directly for the CEO. Um, I mean, our story, the reason why we 
keep it that way. Again, we have the ops and the sales. So we need an independent arbiter of all the facts, of all the fighting that goes on. So that we, there's a true um, sort of independent observer who doesn't have, as they said, a dog in this fight. You know, it's, there's the, uh, the ops guy say, you sold something that I can't deliver. And the sales guy says, I can't meet my quotas because you can't deliver what I sell. Right. So, and then the CEO looks at me and goes, Umur, and then I got to sort of present our sort of objective opinions, and that's why. And it's always been that way. All right. Thank you for answering. Very helpful. All right. Anyone in the audience? For We have uh, two minutes left, so we have just a couple time for a few questions. Go ahead, Ann. Yes, I have a mixed bag. I have people who've been with our organization and in customer service, client experience, client success as we've changed names through the years, and they do not have sales experience. All of the people that I have hired do have some type of sales experience. Uh, they maybe started in sales but don't prefer that as a career, but they do have that negotiating skill. And I, I would just say uh, really strong uh, business skills and capability uh, with uh, a, str a strong ability to also de deliver value through uh, the solution and, the, and that outcome. Um, not necessarily a pure sales, uh, sales talent in that role, though. Agreed. I, I have a variety of skill set. My strongest folks, though, have no sales background, but they can really talk the domain knowledge with the clients. Um, so their, their sales success is pretty strong, but in renegotiations, which we didn't talk too much about, is really where that falls down. Um, and it ends up just being purely downsell um, because they don't know how to navigate that. And my team are uh, sort of legacy engineers. Unfortunately, they don't have neither the business acumen nor the, the sales. So I mean, my experience, um, the most successful skill set is the sort of a business guy. I mean, it's a very unique s skill, and uh, I've always advocated paying significant premium if I could uh, find that skill. I think, I think James had a question. Go ahead, James. So let me repeat the question because I'm not sure everyone could hear. So this is James from HPE, and he said he's fascinated with the quota carrying versus not quota carrying, and how do you incent the CS team, the CS individuals, if they, if they don't have quota? You know, how are you? I think essentially trying to get them to do what you want them to do is I think what he's asking. Mm -hmm. So I throw that to the group. We have a retention bonus that's paid out quarterly, and that's a fairly significant bonus, and it's paid based on percentage of retention. So when they're upselling a client, it's off-selling some churn. So they see their greater return there. We bonus them on a one opportunity if it meets a certain amount. It's a nominal amount, and it doesn't matter if it's a tiny sale or a huge sale. So they get a little bit there, and they like that. But their big motivation is their retention bonus. Yeah, I, I just add also the other opportunity is just look at what uh, activities uh, that might be part of that process or, or playbook actually lead to that, uh, that expansion event or opportunity. Um, and so uh, if you can have any uh, measures that actually uh, are tied to uh, the execution of that process that you know that uh, leads to great outcomes for customers and leads to that expansion or growth event, um, that's another big area of opportunity to uh, uh, put some uh, bonus or compensation around. Uh, I think that's an opportunity. So uh, at, at Tatango, there, there is that uh, accountability also for expansion. Um, but uh, in the absence of that, I, I think uh, those are you know, the behavior parts that lead to that event um, are a great way to uh, you know, just focus people on the behavior that's going to uh, lead to expansion or a high renewal yield. Thank you. 
So, so to put a finer point, at least the Tango piece, uh, it's 50%. So if we look at what we want someone to achieve, revenue sitting right in front of you, 50% uh, of the focus is on driving the renewal and kind of key KPIs, achieving those metrics, achieving those goals. And 50% is on achieving the upsell target. And what we find, at least at Tatango, this is a newer concept uh, for us, is that, and we, you know, we, like all of you, you know, as I said, I've joined the company about 18 months ago, so tried one thing last year, trying a new thing this year, continue to iterate and try and figure out what works best. But we have this idea of, this, of the concept of natural expansion versus sales expansion. And this is what we were referring to earlier. So natural expansion is one where you know, we are working, um, Caitlin, Robin, um, Aaron, who are here today, they are working with the customers very closely. And so as, let's say, Katie, our newest customer, grows, she will, of course, need more licenses and she'll buy more licenses. And that comes from that relationship in the day-to-day -day that they're doing. And that's what we call the natural expansion. Sales expansion is when we go to a new part of the organization, a new business unit. Um, you know, uh, Google's here, Diana is here from Google, and she's Google Chrome. We have a couple other groups of Google, but certainly there's many more parts of Google that one can, uh, that we'll be uh, trying to w work with. So that would be a sales expansion. So we have the, we kind of differentiate expansion as well. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't think so. I think they love to tango. Go ahead. We do not currently have any partners. We are in the process of acquiring a company that does use partners. So I may be throwing that question of what do I do now <laughs> out to all of you in a few months. Yeah, and uh, at Tatango, definitely, I mean, there, there's a, a whole ecosystem around uh, Tatango that just continues to, uh, to expand. And uh, even uh, in terms of product capability, we spent a fair amount of time earlier in the day on success blocks. Uh, that is across uh, you know, the, the industry. And so I think that it absolutely is, is replicated. And actually, I'll point out uh, Bob Crispin, who's right over here, Bob Wave. So Bob is our SVP of channel, and he'll be happy to talk to you about that in more detail, at least as it pertains to Tango, because we have a partner ecosystem. Okay, I think we're over on time, so I'm going to wrap it up. But thanks you, thank everyone on the panel so much. It's super interesting. And of course, you know, come talk to any of these folks tonight at dinner or uh, at the ha happy hour and so forth to get more detailed questions answered. Thank you. <laughs>